we are. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you most of the time, we're some of the youngest people in the pews and we're in our sixties. Uh, to me, that's troubling mm-hmm. because I'm thinking, okay, there's two ways to look at that. Okay. When you hit your sixties and seventies, that's when you start going to mass. Well, maybe not younger people aren't going. Now it could be the fact that we go to the Saturday night mass, which is normally the old people's mass. So that has something to do with it too. I, I know that, but, uh, uh, getting people, younger people more involved and, and, and make it worthwhile for them to go. Uh, that's probably some of the goal of it too, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. How do we, it, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of marketing thing in a way mm, yeah, you know, to be yeah. perfectly frank. Sure. Um, there's a certain, you know, I mean, we're not in the business of making a profit, but we're in the business of saving souls, Sure, <laughs> you know, exactly. and that, that demands a great uh, effort in terms of our, our marketing, if you will. And but so, you, but you've got to market you know, so in a way. I mean, you can't say, but wait, there's more like Ron Papil did. Okay. You, you got to give something, you got to give people a reason to go. Yeah. And, uh, I will say, I'm not going to say never, but not in a long, 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 long time. I've never had a problem attending mass. It was kind of like, I don't know the scripture reading and I'm paraphrasing and it's almost, it's almost heresy for me to think this way, but it's, uh, it was when, when Christ was having a hard time. And people were just rejecting him back and forth and back and forth. And so he looks at Peter and says, yeah, I guess you're going to run off too, right? And he said, where am I going to go? Come on. That's how I've always thought. Okay, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? There's there's no choice. This is the only choice for me. Yeah, that's a beautiful passage in John's gospel. It is. And it it almost sets Christ up as being... I know he was all man and all God, but almost more man than God. And Peter almost almost set him straight by saying that. Uh, again, that's not, I don't mean to be a heretic, but that's kind of what, it's almost like he was having a bad day. Man, okay, I guess, okay, I guess you're going to leave too. No, nah, I can't leave because yeah. where am I going to go? Although I think it also illuminates a key principle in all of this, which is that either, or there is that call to... Um, however you want to put it, market or, or package the message, if you will, in a way mm-hmm. that's going to draw people you know, right. in that call to be creative in what we do. But also the, the fact that people were leaving was because Jesus spoke an unpopular truth that they didn't understand and weren't ready to accept. Sure. And he couldn't change the truth, you know, right. in order to get more people to follow him. And so basically he was saying to Peter, you know, I've chosen you and these other 11 to be my closest followers, the ones who are going to carry this forward after I return to heaven. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is what it is. This is the truth. Yeah. And you're free to go. You know, if you can't stomach this, I can't change it. You're free to go. Um, So there's that that dynamic within our our faith, which is that um, kind of the, the, that middle line that we have to walk is being creative and zealous and engaging with a modern culture that is in so many ways so far from the gospel and, and reaching out and trying to draw in many, many people to this gift that God has given us in our mm-hmm. Christian faith. But we can't compromise the truth. You know, we can't just change what we teach in order to accomplish that that mission, you yeah. know. And so that's the um, that's the high challenge and calling before the church is to stay true to the truth that God himself has revealed and has entrusted now to his church to continue to proclaim in the world today, but to proclaim it in such a way that modern men and women are drawn to that truth, you know, and desire to, to form their lives based on that truth. There's two guys out there, neither one are Christian. In fact, one is an atheist who made profound statements. Uh, you're familiar with Penn Jillette, the uh, magician? No. Okay. And the other one is Jordan Peterson, the clinical psychologist. Are you uh-huh. familiar with him? I am. Okay. Penn Jillette is an atheist. He's he's always been an atheist. He's a, a, guy, a good man, a good human being, but he's just an atheist. But a Christian friend of his kept trying to convert him. And Penn Jillette was so moved with the fact that he was trying to convert him, he said, I could have nothing but the best thoughts for this man because while I don't believe what he believed, 
he believed it so strongly that he really wanted me to be brought into it because if I wasn't, I was going to be missing something. Mm-hmm. And that moved Penn Gillette. Mm-hmm. It really did. Now That's he's still beautiful. an atheist. It didn't move him yeah. enough, but, but he, he had nothing but good things to say about this man. Jordan Peterson. You ask him if he's a Christian. He says, I don't know. He says, I can't, I can't wrap my hands around my mind around the whole resurrection thing. Well, that's kind of the basis of the faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when they ask him if he's a Christian, he says, I don't know, but I try to live my life like I were. Mm-hmm. That's a profound statement too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if I'm not mistaken, he's had something also along the lines of I'm not there, you know, I'm not mm-hmm. fully there yet. I'm not a Christian. I'm not baptized. I'm not a believer. But if this is true, it changes everything. Yeah. You know, like he's intrigued yeah. by it and he's, you can tell he's wrestling. Yeah. With it. He's at least open. And, and that's one of the uh, kind of, I think things that draws people to him is he's, he doesn't per se have a particular agenda. He's just looking for the truth. He is. You know? And he's inviting people along with him in and that he, quest. And he's, he's off the spectrum smart. And we're, my son and I are seeing him again in April. Be the second time I've seen him speak and I want to do it because I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure how much longer he's going to be with us. He's on, he's had so many diseases. He's had so many problems. He's had, he went to Russia to be put into an induced coma. So he get himself off of, uh, mind altering drugs for his depression. It's the only way he could do it. That's the only way he could get out of the, out of the, 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 the drug addiction. Um, uh, his diet is meat and water. That's it. Because he says he can't eat anything else. So the guy's off the, he's, he's off the chart smart, but I think he also realizes that I don't know everything and he's looking for something. Yeah. yeah and I think that's in some ways the key to what the, the church is called to right now is to help people kind of tap into those deeper questions that often I think are just, we don't even think about them because we're so distracted by all mm-hmm. this other surface stuff, you know, that's constantly calling for our attention. Yeah. And yeah. there's, there's so much of it out there. It's, it's, it's the, the shiny thing that you see in your peripheral vision all the time. And you also hear people, well, look at all the problems that church has had, the, the corruption, the sexual scandals, the, uh, the whole financial problems that the Vatican's had. How can you trust those people? Mm-hmm. And what I tell people, I said, look, if every priest became corrupt and if they stole all the money and, and, and ran off to a brothel with it, it wouldn't matter because the priests are just the vehicle. Mm-hmm. The faith is what the church is what can't, it doesn't change. Amen. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not the people it's it. And the people are all flawed. All people are flawed. Right. And what you hear in that uh, here in that Bible and in your podcast, uh, you think people like like Solomon and and David, holy mackerel! They, they were they were horrible people. I mean, David saw, wow, check out that gal. I think I'll have her husband killed in battle and take her for my wife. That was David and Solomon. How many wives did he have? Hundreds. <laughs> I mean, they were flawed people, mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter. If the vehicle is flawed, the word's not flawed. Right. And the vehicle is imperfect, but that's okay. We're all imperfect. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, that's true of David, what you said, but also he's this incredible example of repentance. Right. And humility mm-hmm. and recognition mm-hmm. of his mm-hmm. need for, for God. <laughs> you Translation, know? no matter how bad it is, what you do, if you ask forgiveness, you get it. And right. Yeah. you've never, if David can be forgiven, so can we. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thanks be to God. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. 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 Um, St. John Paul II. Yes, he was a Pope, but he's been fairly recently canonized. Mm-hmm. You have a, a, a special admiration. Yeah. He's a great hero of mine. Tell me that story. Yeah, he, um, well, you know, he, I'm of an age where he was the Pope for <laughs> my whole life, yeah. basically, until mm-hmm. I was um, in the middle of my time in seminary. He died in 
2005, which is right in the middle of my eight years in seminary. Um, and I, I remember when he died, you know, it was like, and then Pope Benedict was elected, who I love as well. I mean, Pope Benedict is brilliant and was a gift to the church and is a gift to the church. But I remember when he walked out in the papal white, it was almost like, who's pretending to be Pope, you know, <laughs> because this isn't the Pope. Right. But, um, yeah, but it was really, um, when he, he came to St. Louis in 1999 and, um, I think everyone in St. Louis remembers that who was around. I was a junior in high school and went to the uh, youth rally that they had at the, then it was the Keel center. Now mm-hmm. it's the enterprise center. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's one thing he said that has always stuck with me, but even more than what he said, there was just a sense of his presence that it was um, kind of getting back maybe to what we were talking about a few moments ago. He brought something more than himself into that arena. Yeah. You know, there was just a, he wasn't there as like a rock star, you know, mm-hmm. to draw people to himself. He brought Christ mm-hmm. and invited us to meet Christ. And um, the moment he came into that uh, arena, I mean, the place was deafeningly loud, like louder than I've ever heard, heard it before, you know? Um, and you just, you just had this sense that there was this holy man right there. I was way up in the nosebleeds, you know, but I felt like he was talking to me uh-huh. when he was speaking and just when he was interacting with the teens. And at the very end, he said to us, these are the words I'll never forget. Christ is calling you. The church needs you. The Pope believes in you and expects great things from you. And uh, those words never left me. It just that all three of those lines, you know, the fact that Christ himself knows me and is calling me to something particular, to do something great with my life, you know, that's his will for me. And that the church needs me. We were just talking about the church's struggles, you know, Mm -hmm. and how the church needs uh, saints. The church needs holy men and women to, to, to live the life of faith and to share it with others. And, but then the, the clincher was just this, he had this way of, of just being so, while speaking to a, a whole crowd, seeming so personal. And when mm-hmm. he said, the Pope believes in you and expects great things from you, I heard it not as like a, all of you out there, but you. as a you, David Skillman, way up there in the nosebleeds, you know, the Pope believes in you. Mm-hmm. He expects great things from you. Yeah. And um, I had never given a thought to becoming a priest. And to be honest, on that day, I didn't think about becoming a priest. But a year later, when that thought first started to um, come up in my heart as I was praying, those words of the Pope came back to me. You know, And um, I think he was just such a, a rock for the church in, in the time that he was Pope, in a very tumultuous time after all that had happened in the 60s and mm-hmm, the 70s mm-hmm. you know, in, the, in our country and around the world just this solid rock and steady presence. I remember after he died, there was this interview on TV with a teenager and uh, the interviewer was kind of marveling at the, these world youth days where, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of teens would go to some place where the Pope was going to be and like baffled by the, this old, what, what is it about this old celibate man, you know, mm-hmm. who's like, you know, by the end of his life, crippled by Parkinson's, you know, what in the world is drawing young people to this guy. And I'll never forget this, this, this teenager they were interviewing said, he loved us enough to tell us the truth. Wow. He loved us enough to tell us the truth. Just that idea that, you know, um, so I, to this day, I, I try to continue to read. He left us so many um, writings, mm-hmm. you know, inclu- and, and his speeches that are written now. So I try to continue to read, and and certainly I I pray to him now as a saint and ask him to help me to be just a fraction of the holy priest that that he was. Well, he he was a special man. Uh, The church has canonized him. Uh, Communism is probably, in my opinion, the biggest evil that we've had in my lifetime. And while President Reagan did his share of of knocking down the wall— uh, so did John Paul II. Yeah. I'll never forget when he was in front of General Jaruzelski in Poland, shaking a finger in his face. This was a man who, who, who led the army of Poland. And John Paul basically undressed him verbally in front of people, and his legs were shaking. Yeah. He was terrified. Uh, within a month or two, 
Poland fell, as did the rest of the communist world, and, and, and the rest is history.